Wonderful. We're on the air. Finally. I've been waiting all morning. <laughs> well, at least you've had something to something to follow on the at the conference. Yeah. Um, it's it's so great to have you here on TFT. It really is. I've been asking people in my little Dutch IT session what the meaning is of their family names. So, Mr. Billing, please tell us what is a billing. Ah, uh, well. Um I uh, when I got married in 2008 I took the uh, last name of my wife so I used to have a last name of Fritzen and Fritzen is actually as you can hear a uh, son of a someone uh, and it was my great great grandfather that was named Fritz Carlson and then his son of course became a Fritzen and then it was on from that. Uh, if I go back to my, my current last name, I think it's originating from Denmark, uh, but I haven't been exploring it um, that much. Uh, but before building, I know that the family name was Bono, uh, and it's, it's been originating from a, from a, a, a circus in the late... 1880 somewhere. So uh, my 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 wife is from uh, originally from a circus family. Oh, fancy that! That's a wonderful bit of background. And you've you've taken on your wife's family name. Yeah. Well, that's unusual for lots of people. That's very unusual. Well, it's it's. Uh, she wanted to keep hers, and uh, I'm I'm uh, I just wanted to avoid the double ones. So it just it, makes life harder to write all the the signatures and everything to have double. Yeah, good. Well, I'm glad at least we've got a bit of diversity at the <laughs> conference because you know seriously, I, I, I love all the speakers that we've got in the uh, in the EMEA section. Um, of course, we've got two special speakers who are presenting live: Rob England and Chris Dancy, who aren't from EMEA, but no, the other guys. Yeah, the the but the other guys, you know, in Mia, there's certainly no African in there. There's there's no no east, there's no east, there's no even middle really. It's all about Europe, and they're all male, and they're all white. So at least we've got somebody with an exotic family name. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's about the only bit of diversity we've got. Yeah, but possibly apart from Barclay Ray, who of course being Scottish, probably has some some kind of pagan beliefs. That we uh, that other people don't understand. Anyway, I'll talk talk to him about talk to him later about uh, about that. Yeah, I guess this is the the far north we go during TFT. I don't know if there is any other. Maybe Peter in Canada is more north from from Sweden, but um, yeah. Okay, right. Let's get on with the show. So, uh, welcome everyone and um, thank you for taking time to um, review my presentation about service automation. Um, the great thing about these kind of virtual conferences is that you can follow s so many other gifted and, and knowledgeable, knowledgeable and experienced people. Um, and I was rewriting some of the materials just up till 10 minutes ago. Uh, and if you did listen to Dave just before me here, you can you could uh, pick up some of the, the the points he'd have in his agile approach, and that was about automation and automate uh, whatever can be automated, and that the tooling is an, an essential part for for having an agile service delivery. So uh, I will try to then elaborate on that one. Um, I cannot take credit for this title um, because I more or less um, got it from a visit to IKEA. Um, as you might know, I'm a Swede and we, we spend a lot of time at IKEA. Uh, and uh, they have in these small uh, stands at IKEA where they, where, where they have an like an apartment, uh, and the apartments can be somewhere between 30 and 40 square meters big. Uh, and uh, their message is to not view only the, the square meters you have, 
uh, you should also look into the height of the room to really utilize all the space you have available. And that was the inspiration for this title. And that's also something I tried to bring uh, along to the customers uh, that even if you, you're on a tight budget and you are on, uh, tight on resources, uh, there is still plenty of room for making uh, improvements. Uh, another thing that comes up whenever I start out uh, at a new customer is um, my title. Uh, I present myself as a reality architect, but what does it really mean? Well, um, to be really straightforward, I try to use um, whatever kind of process documentation the customer use and I try to um, get the feeling of the culture of the company and listen to the people who's doing the actual work and mix those complex um, relations together and find a simple solution for it. Could be that I'm jumping ahead a bit. Um, I, I noticed when I did the recording that my slides are, are a couple of seconds behind my talk. So, but uh, starting out, what is automation all about? Uh, this is my reflection on automation. Uh, it's about creating deliveries that not do not require the control, and of course eliminates one of the biggest remaining obstacles, uh, the human factor yourself. Um, I would like to look at automation as similar to good management principles. And as a good manager or leader, you set a, a guidance. Uh, you create rules, you create standards, uh, you empower people um, by delegating, for instance, um, to take responsibility. And for me, it's a bit similar with the automation. Uh, you, you need to create those um, rules and guidelines and um, open up the possibilities for people to automate uh, their current work tasks. So <clears throat> let's go back uh, at least 10 years and see what is happening all around us in terms of our the services provided all around us. Daniel, we, yeah. can I just interrupt you for a minute? Please do. It looks, looks like your slides aren't coming, coming across. We have a blank screen mm -hmm. at the moment. That's yeah, I've got something back now. Yeah, I think we're okay now. So I will try to go full screen and hope you fully can see it. And uh, not at the moment, it's just a white screen. Uh, give me oh, yeah. one second. I think it's when I go to full screen. So let's see if I can just do like this instead. So, what was these technical glitches? Yeah, that's okay. What are those funny animations, by the way? Was it, have you, are you projecting something on you on the wall behind you? No, well, it's just to uh, create some uh, disturbing visages, visual uh, pictures. Yeah, very clever. <laughs> so, how do I now skip out of this one, uh, Mark, to go to yeah, the I'll take, one? Yeah, take your time. Got plenty of time. Uh, maybe I just should share my share my desktop instead. Um, and then I have the problem with multiple. So let's see if I share my desktop one. Start screen share. Lots of duplications there. And go there and. Hopefully you can see my 
pictures now. Okay, it looks good. So, we're off again. I'm muting myself again. Thanks for sorting that out. So, um, back on track. Um, where do we want to go now? Yeah, well, um, there is a number of services uh, all around us in our daily uh, life that has been automated already. I cannot see people uh, today wanting to go into an actual bank to get their money. And I think that in five years we will not even have money. It will all be digital money. Um, I can go to myself and uh, <clears throat> go to this little fella here in the bottom left corner. This is my best friend from May to begin of October. Um, I normally spend one to one and a half hour every week just cutting my grass. So this automated lawnmower is my best friend because that creates time for me that I can spend with my family instead. And if we see the first prototypes coming out, they were quite stupid. Uh, nearly not, uh, you can nearly not call them robots because they were going without no sense of direction, cutting um, from one side and then redirecting, cutting another one. The, what's happening uh, with technology here is that these robots are now getting really, really intelligent. So they can cut in shapes. Um, they can, uh, you can set directions, you can set, uh, they are built in gyroscopes. You can say that if, if you have, are tilting more than 15 degrees, you should turn around. And they even know when they are hungry. So they go back and recharge. So it's, it's amazing to see what technology do um, with, with all these, um, um, with these services that we have uh, been doing ourselves. And of course, not all services should be automated. This pool cleaning robot, uh, it's, a, it's a good idea, uh, it's a good invention, but uh, I think that most people uh, would prefer the original, the original service is the best one provided for pool cleaning. Now we talked about, and I, let's go down to uh, what we do with service management and service delivery. Uh, this is a post uh, from three weeks ago where um, IBM Watson, uh, which is a supercomputer that was uh, challenging the grandmasters in jeopardy, uh, is utilized as a customer service agent. So uh, according to Forbes, about 112 billion um, is spent on call centers each year for different kind of customer service related services. About 50% of all these calls go unresolved, meaning that you call and you don't get the decent answer for your uh, request. And we see that using um, the power and the inbuilt, so to say, knowledge uh, with Watson, we can reduce those and we can also do it with 40% faster searching. And you can imagine using this, for instance, at uh, insurance or banking, uh, phoning in, asking a questions like, um, what is the, um, the um, the discount rate for, or the interest rate for this kind of loan. And as, an, and as a customer, you don't care if that answer is provided by a real person or by a artificial person. And who can really tell the difference in the future? So why do people want automation? Um, we can see in, in Dave's uh, presentation as well that it's, it's mostly 
about money. That's the main reason. More or less all the business cases uh, I've been involved with are uh, <clears throat> circle around saving money. And uh, as stated a million times before, um, IT budgets are cost. Uh, IT budgets are, are, are cut with costs, but they are supposed to deliver more value. And the one of the, the only ways to deliver more value with less money is, of course, to do automation. Uh, the second most uh, common topic is the ability, ability availability to, to reduce the risks. And if I go to the Nordic market, at least, we, we have an and challenge uh, with the aging workforce. Um, we have people that in five to 10 years will retire and they will, they will remove a lot of knowledge, uh, industry knowledge and take that with them. What we can do with automation is to uh, capture much of that knowledge. Uh, we can review uh, the work tasks that are being done and try to standardize that uh, in order to, to control uh, th those risks. Um, and then, uh, of course, it's about delivering more uh, and being time to market. When we, when we do require or request services today, we uh, uh, as Ian mentioned in his presentation about the having all these tools and gadgets so close to us, we want response in second, not days or weeks. Uh, if I go, um, if I go traveling and I want to grab a bus or a train, I don't review the schedule uh, of the trains or buses leaving in three or five or ten hours. I go into my app and I would like to see what kind of info, uh, what kind of services available now in five minutes. And very essential for this is the self-service. Uh, I think one part of having automation is that you can provide the services uh, directly to the end customer, uh, which means that you can you can fulfill your, or, and, and also, also then measure the, the impact of not delivering the services. So this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, I just needed to bring this into the, my presentation. Um, this picture is the Holy Trinity, and the Holy Trinity for me uh, is the, people, the process, and the technology. So we have these uh, shining guys in the middle representing these. And automation has this effect that you need all these main components in order to establish automation. Uh, you need to bring um, people in, you need to establish the process and you need the technology to um, fulfill uh, the automation. And if you look on the guy over here on the left side, I think that's actually the process guy because you can see that the processes are bleeding and you can also see that <clears throat> there is an, a couple of uh, people here in the bottom get that get stamped on and that's probably the process owners because independent how good they try to to view the process and the culture they always get kicked down for some reason so back to the fun part um, I like to share some of the pieces uh, that I do f in my in my uh, on my assignments um, when we go to the or actually approached it for the first time we went to um, if this was a, a, a customer within uh, manufacturing so we actually went to the people uh, on the assembly line and 
took some of the materials they were working on when they um, uh, they do assemble yeah, on the production line, so to say. Um, and they had, of course, a number of years um, of using lean approach. And we used one of their um, uh, guidelines, so to say, or, or one of their um, spreadsheets, and we just adjusted slightly to fit into IT, and we called it operator activity analysis. And this was a way to uh, collect the high level objects and then drill down uh, into one of these high uh, details or drill into the details of one of these objects to make investigations. So one example could be uh, onboarding, for instance, where we started with uh, the registration of new employee. We saw that that is an, an high level objective to do the registration. We then identified that it's done uh, in the HR department. We found out the responsible uh, for that process and those procedures. We then uh, made a number of interviews where we tried to break down uh, that high level objective into smaller pieces and going as detailed as possible and uh, identifying if those activities could be automated. Uh, also measure if it could, uh, the, the time spent on each task, if it was a repeatable task, uh, and also if there was some compliance uh, required. Because some of these um, I activities could be automated, uh, but there was some compliance involved, so it wasn't easy just to, um, to replace it with, with some automated work. We needed to do some additional activities and, or add on some activities. Uh, but the main thing here was really to capture the people responsible for doing their part in this delivery. Um, and then try to make an estimate and build the business case, uh, business case out of that one. One of the things that we saw was, was essential was to have an end-to-end -end view for this um, analysis. Um, I have here on the right side an example where we uh, looked on, for instance, a virtual server. Uh, we said that we need to provide these services starting from some sort of catalog. It might not be a, a service or a request catalog in terms of a web page. It could be an, just a an, an link on the internet page or that sends an email to the, to the IT department or to the network nation or whatever. But there will have to be somewhere where we, where we present the service and the availability of the service make it available. Um, that created some kind of request. Uh, we then tried, if it was pos if possible, to determine some kind of expectations in terms of delivery. Um, the next step was to see if there were approvals involved to these requests. Uh, could we empower people to do uh, these approvals as early in the stage as possible, not involving too many people. Uh, because then, of course, the more people that got involved, the longer delivery uh, time we ended up with. We then um, tried to map a workflow for the request itself and saw uh, that in the in the relation to uh, virtual server, we had some provisioning. So how do we handle, how can we um, automate the actual creation of these virtual servers? We ended up with another workflow um, on, that was executed by the actual provisioning. So we need to handle the deviations. So if 
something went wrong during the execution of the provisioning, what do we do with those deviations and how do, how do we communicate those? For most customers, this was an, quite an easy way. This is something they have been doing in some areas uh, for quite some time. What we wanted to do is to uh, end the cycle by reviewing whatever comes out. So we need the output from that delivery to go into some kind of configuration storage. So how can we record that we have done something? And how do we measure that the, the service is delivered uh, on the levels we have the expectations on from the end users? And then we tried to get some, some easy governance on this. Um, this was also a hard one because it's easy to go ballistic on governance. Uh, we tried to pick up some control points uh, in order to feed the continual service improvement. Uh, and it's uh, back again to the measurements. How can I measure that uh, I do improve the automation next time? Because uh, as the same way as the automated lawn mover, uh, the first prototype were, were quite simple, but then you need to improve your automation over and over again. So these automation processes are also a, a, a strong candidate for having into your continual service improvement. Um, some examples from the reality as well. Um, for you that have reviewed some of the blogs coming out regard, uh, in relation to TFT uh, from the other sites, you know that uh, Zapier uh, is used to push this content from TFT to a number of sources. So instead of having a bunch of people um, pushing it to slide your share to YouTube, to Vimeo, uh, everything is done via um, automation uh, in Zapier. Uh, and this is, this is then an, a way for us to make sure that we deliver the TFT presentations in timely manner uh, and within the expectations of the audience, of course. I also have a, a personal automation tool called IFT, I-F-T-T, -T, um, that I use uh, whenever I go to customer sites. And I use this uh, in a combination of Foursquare and, and in my Google Calendar. So whenever I go to a customer site, I check into Foursquare. That sends a um, uh, calendar um, push into my Google Calendar so I know where I have been and at what time. I can then export that from, from Google and do my time reporting at the end of the week. So it's easing up my workload uh, in terms of time reporting as a consultant as well. Seeing is believing, and I just picked up two of the customer cases I know. I have not been um, directly involved myself with this one, uh, but at Axford, Axford is a Swedish uh, retailer um, in the, um, having a number of grocery stores. Um, they had a number of employees going... Um, in and out of the company, of course, depending uh, on the, um, the, the workload during vacation times, for instance, the summer times. And they needed to increase, especially the quality and the security for onboarding, offboarding. So they made an automation between their, um, their folder and the Active Directory handling uh, and their HR system. So whenever a person was offboarded or instantly terminated, uh, within a number of hours, uh, everything was executed and the restrictions were set uh, in terms of uh, security access. 
So they went uh, from being dependent on people doing all these corrections uh, and delivery time reduced from weeks uh, into eight hours. And the primary business case here was really the, the security level. Uh, the, my second choice was actually a publication from CERN. Uh, you know those um, physicians sitting down in Switzerland. Uh, they have done some amazing things with their, their service or request catalog. Uh, the amazing thing I would say here is that they have incorporated so much into their uh, service delivery that is non-IT so of course they have the all the other like print services they have the security uh, and and the the it services but they also have uh, sanitary services they have visitor access they have car and rental services and without automation handling this amount of number of of cases would be impossible and as you know the, the persons working down there should focus on finding Higgs particle and not on uh, requesting or um, asking their service desk where the goods and deliveries are. Uh, you can just Google CERN and service automation and you can find some uh, pretty nice uh, writings there. So, um, some things I discovered and I really try to pick out the soft things. Um, we, we, um, we saw that um, people, despite my, my, my beliefs, didn't uh, retract or try to control their knowledge and their skills. They were very open. Uh, they were very engaged, very enthusiastic uh, about creating automation. Um, I believe that most people don't want to do these repetitive, repetitive uh, and boring tasks. Uh, and uh, they came up with tons of ideas for uh, doing automation in other areas. Uh, it also, they also saw that they, it created time for them for doing additional innovation. So it created time and, and it created um, or set the, the, the mental stage that always do improve your and review what you're doing uh, daily at work. Uh, another area was um, collaboration and Dave touched upon this as well in his presentation that uh, collaboration increased and especially awareness. When, when we got the IT people to open up what they wanted from other areas or other departments or, or business units, um, it created awareness between like HR and IT because HR could see that, yeah, well, okay, so you, this is what you do with the inputs we give you. So if we just polish that, uh, or, or add on some things, you can provide your services uh, mo in, in, in a more, in a faster way um, and also in a, in a, in within a higher quality. And that created a huge improvement in reputation. So IT reputation was raised uh, and, and uh, I think especially during the, the lunch breaks, uh, people start, uh, instead of sitting with the, on the, uh, at the IT table, people started to blend more because they have some common interest. Uh, but of course, there is a lot of challenges with, it, with this area as well. And uh, one of the challenges, of course, the complexity. Um, there are so many parameters to consider. Um, there are business cases that uh, grow so you end up with projects that are six to twelve months uh, long and it incorporates uh, integration to 12 different systems and the return when return on investments is, is um, 
doubtable, you can say. Uh, and then you also see the lack of standards. Even if we say that, well, okay, uh, all the systems can can uh, talk web services together uh, to to share the information, but they they do it in 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 a slightly different way. So you end up with having technology for some of the legacy systems uh, a headache. Um, and then it's always this. Uh, this point about trust and human acceptance, um, we we saw that even if we automated some of these tasks, people still would go in and and double check if it was actually done, um, and it takes time to change this um, this behavior of control. Um, because people felt still that they they were responsible for the actual outcome, and and, and the responsibility as such is a good thing, uh, but they should, in order to create the time, we don't want them to to uh, use the time to just control instead of doing it. Uh, and then we had the area of of exception uh, exception handling. So whenever th whenever things did go wrong, and things do go wrong. That's why we have all this major incident handling and stuff like that. But exception handling was a tricky one. Um, whom to uh, to communicate with? Uh, should we communicate? And uh, should we automate exceptions as well? And what is the cost of that? Um, and also, when when things go wrong, uh, people want to get people want to get involved because they want to be this IT hero all the time. So, uh, in order to create some time for questions and answers, um, if you would like to know more, uh, you can reach me on my Twitter handle or on my email. Um, and as um, James Gander also pointed out, I'm um, quite uh, active on the both of the back to ITSM groups, both on Facebook and on Google Plus, um, or you can reach me on uh, ITSM Weekly, the um, web podcast, Top of the World Edition. So, if you want to highlight a subject for for the next podcast, just drop an email and we will take it up. And I would like to end this uh, presentation with a Chinese proverb. Um, I, to be more straightforward, I like to say, just get the hell out of my way, because don't interrupt me when I'm trying to do something new or change something that has been might have been working but uh, could be done in a improved way. So, thank you everyone for taking your time. Mr. Billing, that was wonderful. Thank you. It was nice to fin finally, after hundreds of, of corrections to my presentations, be able to present it. <laughs> yeah, great, great, great. It's always fascinating to um, to discover what kind of tooling people use. You know, you mentioned your combination of um, of this and that. You know, I'm always amazed at the, the creative combinations that people come up with. Wonderful. Yeah, and one thing uh, that I, I tell my customers is that it's not about going out and, sh and buy the most shiny tool. There is a number of tools that you can start using that is for free. So yeah, start, up, start, start out with this one. And, and my suggestion is also that take an easy pick. I mean, pick uh, an, uh, a service or a part of the delivery that you feel is known to you and that you feel you have the, the, the right persons for. Um, and start utilizing the tools that are available for automating that kind of part of the delivery. Yeah, well, that's interesting, talking about looking at the kind of people that you have and adjusting the tooling choice to, uh, to sort of accommodate their, you know, what they're familiar with, what they're comfortable with. 
Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, yeah, this is a very scary talk of yours. You're really, you're really sort of pushing the pushing the ideas of automation to the limits. Yeah, I, How, yeah, I, a, I had I had a, a similar presentation at the Service Desk Forum in in Stockholm a couple of weeks ago. And I, I started out with telling them that probably 70 to 80 percent of you will go into total uh, denial <laughs> after this presentation. Yeah, yeah, it's a big shock. Of course, we we come if you go back a hundred years or so, we, we come from a situation where people's work existence identity was possibly defined by a good job in manufacturing. You made something, and that sort of defined your identity. And when that was replaced increasingly by automation, people sort of got into an identity crisis, and of course the economy moved around a lot. And now it seems that the same thing is going to happen to the service industry, where a hundred years ago manufacturing jobs were being autom automated, and um, some people were benefiting it from, and some people weren't. The same kind of shake-up seems to be on the cards for the knowledge workers yeah and that you know that's 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 scary uh, on, on the other hand I, I feel that that most people working in in uh, in our industry have, or in the as a knowledge worker have felt that they are in the safe zone and I really uh, embrace the idea when when p when there are things coming up that challenge our safety zone because that means that we need to start thinking um, ourselves we need to review what we are doing uh, for, uh, daily at our work yeah no I, I agree you know you say we, we think we're in the safe zone that reminds me of um, the Irish management guru Charles Handy and his line of everything, you know, he sort of draws a line that goes from, um, you know, the things things get created, then they develop, and then they, they tail off. And what he says is, you've got to reinvent yourself um, before it's too late. Absolutely. You think you think you're safe, but something is just around the corner that's going to change. It it also reminded me about something I'd heard on a, it was a couple of podcasts that I heard on the BBC. It's Peter Day's, he's got a couple of business programs and all the stuff's been recorded and they were talking about how uh, productivity used to be in pretty close alignment with, um, uh, with job growth. So, you know, productivity would increase and job growth would increase at the same time. But since sometime in the 90s, Whereas productivity has continued to increase less so than in the past because of the, the global economic um, depression, job growth has sort of fallen off a cliff. Fewer jobs and a lower median income. And that's possibly as a result of people investing more in automation and less in actual, you know, the, the jobs that we're all familiar with. Which is, you know, scary kind of stuff. Yeah, and and you can you could tell that from the, the Dutch session as well that uh, they were talking about <coughs> learning Mandarin uh, because the Chinese people will take over all of our jobs. But I mean, look, ten fifteen years ahead, when all the Chinese people have reached the uh, middle class and they don't want to produce anymore, who's supposed to produce their stuff? Um, and then, of course, we can turn to other countries like uh, Bangladesh or, I don't know, some in South America maybe that could do part of it. But, but still, they don't have the, the, the education level and the logistics for doing that at this stage. Um, instead, look at some of the things going on, like the, you have the industry assembly robot uh, Baxter who um, more or less do the had the same cost as a Chinese labor worker, and he he could probably run um, for a longer time than a than a Chinese worker with a, a soaring back and yeah uh, those working yeah. conditions. 
No, you know, this is this is really really serious disruptive stuff. And if you if you think certainly at a global level about how it, how it, uh, economic and societal benefits are distributed. Uh, that's a great challenge. And also the idea, if our work, like the how people used to be defined by a job in manufacturing, now we are currently being defined by the job, the jobs, the knowledge work jobs that we are doing today, when we lose that, you know, what will be a definition of a meaningful life? That is, that is serious stuff. Yeah, now, now we're going into the, to the mindfulness kind of uh, <clears throat> part of this. And uh, I, I, I truly believe that you, you I, mean, I mean, we do automation for one purpose from our personal view, and that is, I think, laziness. We, we don't want to do more than we, when we are um, forced to do. Uh, and if, if 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 you see some of the the automation done, if if I can, um, if I have a work, uh, and I'm uh, measured by the amount I produce, even as a knowledge worker, uh, and I can automate fifty percent of that uh, production, should I then be laid off for fifty percent, or should I still be yeah. hundred percent available? Because I'm produ I am producing. I am delivering the same kind of um, hopefully business outcomes than than before, but in a more controlled and and a more structured way. Yeah, that's right. Now you're just employing new means to do it. Yeah, now fascinating. I'm I'm glad you you broached on mindfulness. What I noticed at conferences increasingly, virtual and physical conferences. People are daring to talk about the other side of IT, mm -hmm. about the more personal side. Um, it reminded me of a book that um, Professor Clayton Christensen, the guy who came up with the innovator's dilemma as a concept, he's um, recently published a book sort of reflecting on his life, uh, asking the question, how will you measure your life? And that's sort of thinking about what, you know, what are you actually in it for? Yeah. What kind of values do you value? Um, and how does that, um, how does it influence the kind of, you know, the kind of jobs do you take on? Does it matter whether you work for a, a company that is in the gun running business as opposed to, um, an organization like Am Amnesty International, just to quote one of uh, one of the organizations on the other other end of the scheme. You know, I'm just in IT, but if if the company you're working for is in the gun running business, I think that says, that says something about the kind of values that you have. And people are talking about this more and more. Yeah, and I I think most people create a kind of balance if they are working at a or they are employed by someone doing a, a doubtful business, I think they try to balance that in uh, during their private time instead. So they get more, they are encouraged to do more uh, on their private side with, with those kind of foundations and doing uh, volunteer work, for instance. So I, 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 I believe in mankind. I, I have been, uh, traveling at a number of events now and also meeting so many digital acquaintances and people are in general very open and very kind uh, so I, I truly believe in, in mankind in the future as well and if we can reduce some of the stress we get from our workload I think we could we can benefit from some from additional time uh, spent on mindfulness instead I can't think of a better quote than uh, I believe in mankind than to use that to close the close this session. It's, it's been pleasure. great. I think you stimulated lots of people around the world with the talk. Yeah, and I apologize for one thing, and that is uh, that I wasn't able to find my beaver costume last night. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, but I, I will save it. I will save it for next year. Yeah, oh, that's good. Well, we've got to. We've got to invite you back. Well, people have got to vote for you next time as well. Yeah, Get and I, 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 I will be popping up as as a really nice beaver. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, we're lo looking forward to that. Okay. With, with those immortal words, I'm going to end the broadcast. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, Been a thank pleasure. You. Take care. Bye Good now. luck. Bye. Introducing MyIT from BMC Software. One quick download and the way your users think about IT changes forever. Let's say they need a networked printer, or a Wi-Fi connection, or even a map of an office they're visiting. MyIT already knows where they are and shows them a list of available resources and services pre-configured for their devices. Or maybe your user needs help with something more complex. With MyIT, they can do most things themselves. But if they can't, they can simply schedule an appointment with a technician who can. In short, MyIT is built to make your IT organization more modern and your users infinitely happier, dramatically changing the perception of your services.